Welcome to your space journey, where we venture into the future of space exploration and the incredible leaders who are taking us there. Hello, welcome to your space journey. It's my privilege to introduce our special guest today, Brian May. Brian, as you may know, is the lead guitarist for the rock group Queen. He also has a doctorate in astrophysics. But before we get to his interview today, I'd like to introduce our segment again called Your Space Journey. This is where fans like you call in and tell us their space journey. They tell us what they're excited about space and what they're most looking forward to for the future of space exploration. Here's Molly Kearns of the NASA Glenn Research Center telling her story. Your Space Journey. Hi, my name is Molly Kearns, and I work with the Space Communications and Navigations Department at NASA Glenn Research Center in Cleveland, Ohio. My space journey began when I was very young. Both of my parents actually worked for NASA my whole life. But interestingly enough, that isn't really when I got um, invested in the space industry. So when I was in my undergraduate school um, of college, my parents encouraged me to apply for an internship at NASA. And the field that I was studying is marketing and digital and social media marketing. So at first I didn't really see um, if I didn't think there was a spot for me at NASA. So at first I wasn't actually on board with the idea, but I actually applied. It turned out there were some great internship opportunities that were um, in my field and actually did align with the arts. And so I ended up getting an internship with the Space Communications and Navigations Internship Program. So I completed two internships with them. And it was a really great experience because they let me build the internship based off of what I was interested in and what skills I had so I could provide the most value to their internship program. So that's actually the first place I ended up doing any graphic design work. And because of that internship, I realized that I was really passionate about graphic design and specifically graphic design for space related promotional material. So um, I was lucky enough that when I graduated with my master's last year, the Space Communications and Navigations Department, or SCAN, offered me a full-time position where I now work. And it's actually really awesome because I get to help out with the SCAN internship program, or SIP, that I was a part of when I was an intern. So now I get to help all the interns like with career development and just all the great things that they helped me with when I was an intern. One thing that I'm really excited personally for the future of space exploration is just encouraging the next generation to get involved. One thing that I help out with a lot with SCAN is public outreach events. So we love to go around and inspire the next generation, which we call the Artemis generation, about um, NASA's upcoming missions, you know, going back to the moon by 2024 and eventually onward to Mars. So I'm really excited just to see the world get inspired about this mission and get as excited as we are about it. Your Space Journey. Thank you, Molly, for sharing your story. If you'd like to share your story with us, we'd love to hear it. You can leave us a voicemail by calling 317-862-4700, or you can email us an audio or video clip uh, at info at yourspacejourney.com. Just be sure to give us your name, tell us what inspires you about space, and what you're most excited about for the future of space exploration. Please keep your stories to less than two minutes, please. We'd appreciate that. Now on to today's special guest, Brian May. Uh, made a Christmas come true for me last year. I was fortunate to speak Brian, with Brian over the phone um, just before Christmas last year about his incredible passions from going um, from, from the rock group Queen to moving into the realm of astrophysics. If you saw the blockbuster hit Bohemian Rhapsody, that tells the story even more how he was working on his PhD in astrophysics and then Queen took off. And so he took a hiatus from that uh, until about 10 years ago, he went back and completed his PhD work. And now he's very active in that community. Um, after I had the phone conversation with him, I was very fortunate to actually meet him in person a week later for the flyby of what's called Aerocoth now. It was Ultima Thule back then, but we were at the Applied Physics Laboratory um, on New Year's Eve. So I got to spend New Year's Eve um, as the countdown went on with Brian May and a few hundred other special folks and scientists and media representatives. Really cool thing. One thing that really impressed me the most about Brian is how he blends 
art and science together. Here's a clip from his press conference that he gave at APL last year talking about how he blends the sciences with art. Yeah, because I was brought up in school to believe that if you're an artist, you couldn't be a scientist. And if you're a scientist, you could not be an artist. You couldn't be a musician. So I've kind of fought for that all my life. So to me, it is very important, and it's very interesting to do this. Um, yeah, I, I get up every day and feel curious about everything and feel excited about stuff which has never been done before. And it's starting to, to blend together more and more at this moment, I think, as I, as I stand here before you guys, who are mainly scientists, you know, but all of you, I notice, are interested in, in the musical side and in the, in the artistic side. And so many astronomers um, nowadays are musicians or artists and whatever, astronauts too. I'm lucky enough to have spent time with, with a lot of astronauts. Most of them have some kind of artistic leanings. Um, and I feel that, that mankind is kind of coming back together and putting the two halves of its existence together. And I think art and science should be more connected. And I think science will be more inspired if it allows itself to become more instinctive. And music will be better for allowing science into it. You know, science meaning knowledge. You know, the original mean, meaning of science is knowledge. You know, knowledge is what informs everything we do. And as human beings, we procreate. We continue our species, but if there's some other reason to be here, then it's somewhere in this area of discovering the world around us. I think that's the gift that mankind has been given. Now, before we get to my phone interview with Brian, here's another clip I want to share from his press conference at APL where he talked about how to use your imagination to fuel your passion. It's great that we talk about Patrick, I think, because he was the last of a generation, the last of a kind. And if you talk to Patrick more about the moon, it wasn't like a theory. It wasn't like, oh, yes, I can answer your question if I go into this book or whatever. It was like he was there. He had been there. He had lived there in his mind. And he used his imagination to tell you what it would be like. So I would say my advice would to, to kids who are inspired by this stuff is allow your imagination to fuel you because it's, it's not just about learning facts. It's not just about being able to regurgitate facts or whatever. It's not just about um, figures. It's not just about science and in inverted commas. It's about asking the right questions. And for that, you need imagination. You need to be inspired by what you're looking at. It's like if you were allowed out in, in a different country. Suppose you were taken blindfolded to a new country you'd never seen before. You opened your eyes. It would be about just following your nose and, and being inspired and searching out what appeals to you. It wouldn't be about looking at a textbook. It wouldn't be about looking at a map or, you know, ways. <laughs> it would be about, you know, finding your own way in the world. And to me, that's what science should be. I think that's what's fueled someone like Alan, who has an incredible imagination, incredible, uh, unusual way of thinking, thinking outside the box. That's what the best science is about, is about to me. Well, we all know that Brian is an incredible musician, but where did his passion for space begin? Here's the phone interview where Brian was telling me how his space journey began. Well, it's childhood passions. Um, I had a passion for music as a child, and I also had a huge passion for the stars. And probably the greatest inspiration of all was a program called The Sky at Night, um, which was an English program which ran for 50 years yes, with right. the same presenter. Do you know about that? You probably do. Was that the one with, I, I'm trying to remember, was it Patrick Moore or was it not? That's right, exactly, yeah. And I used to beg my parents to be allowed to stay up and watch it because it was quite late. It was 10 o'clock at night. Yes. <laughs> and to me, that was the most inspiring thing in the world, uh, just to be able to see the, the world through his eyes and not just the world, but the whole universe. And... Um, Strange enough, I was very inspired by the music which he'd chosen to start and end the program as well. Which really? By Sibelius. Mm -hmm. So music and astronomy always had a kind of um, a, a link for me. I, <laughs> I, I'm a very instinctive person, I suppose, but somehow <laughs> that was just completely inspiring to me, the combination of those images and that sound. And that's the, the area which I guess I'm in right now, which is amazing. Now, one of the incredible projects that Brian has released recently was his song about New Horizons. Again, this is the spacecraft that explored Pluto in 2015 and flew by Arrokoth um, at the beginning of 2019. Here's Brian talking about his inspiration for writing a song about New Horizons. Yeah, it was a fantastic opportunity, um, as you say, to combine the passions. And um, it came upon me in a rush. <laughs> 
really? <laughs> in a strange way. You know, somebody was asking me how it happened, and I don't really know quite how it happened. The idea came from Alan, because he said, can you make some music for the flyby? Um, he just kind of threw that at me uh, about three months ago. And at the time, I thought, hmm, I think that's going to be difficult, because I can't see myself writing a song about ultimate Thule, or Thule, or how you pronounce it. Sure. It didn't immediately come to mind. But as I turned it over in, in my head, in the next couple of weeks, I started to get a vision because this really represents the furthest that the hand of man has ever reached right. in terms of, of photographing an object in the Kuiper belt. This has never been done before. And I started to think about the motivations for mankind for doing this. Um, you know, human beings have this desire to, to explore and to go places that have never been visited before. And that, that's always been the case. Um, so the song in my mind somehow was going to be about that. It, it's going to be quite broad. It'll be about the mission in particular, which is something extraordinary, Absolutely. but it will also be about the whole NASA thrust and about okay. human exploration in general. So then I have all these ideas floating around in my mind and I have a kind of musical feeling and I put, a few, uh, I put some stuff down in the studio, which was purely instrumental, mm -hmm. but it gave me that feeling of rushing through space. And then... As sometimes happens, by pure coincidence, I went out to dinner with my old friend Don Black. I don't know if you know Don, but he's a world-famous lyricist. He goes yes. back such a long way. He, he wrote the lyrics for Born Free, yeah. for instance. Um, so many amazing songs over the years, mm -hmm. uh, including a lot of work with Andrew Lloyd Webber. He's a great friend, and we sat there having dinner, and I mentioned this project. So Don looked at me kind of quizzically and said, oh, I'll have a think about it if you like. And I went, yeah, absolutely, do that. <laughs> anyway, the next morning, I get up and in my email box is an email from Don Black with two verses, very simple verses, uh, just the lyrical ideas. And that was enough. That just kicked me into the place I needed to be. Suddenly, I knew what I was going to do. I rushed down to the studio and started singing. Now, I haven't oh. really sung <laughs> as a solo artist for, for many years. Yeah. But this inspired me. You know, mostly I've been writing stuff in the last few years for my friend Kerry Ellis, mm -hmm. and we've made a couple of albums together. So I, I tend to think, I tend to write for her voice rather than mine. So I wrote something which was way too high for me to sing. <laughs> <laughs> but gradually I managed to adapt it, and the whole thing just started to come together. I, I just got excited, and, and uh, the thing has really grown into something which I feel very, um, very good about. But Brian May is also incredibly into 3D photography. As a matter of fact, earlier this year, he came out with his second 3D book where he worked with astronomy editor David Iker. Here's Brian talking about his passion for 3D. Yeah, I was lucky enough to be there uh, for the Pluto flyby, which is an experience I will never forget. And I was there when those first images came in, and I was able to actually put together the first stereo pair to get a, a 3D picture of of uh, Pluto and Pluto. Yeah, I thought that was amazing. I was just, yeah, it, there's stuff that I will never, ever forget in my life. You know, I'm so privileged to be around in those situations. You mentioned about the, th the first 3D image of Pluto that you put together, and I have to admit, I, I really am interested. I do have your latest book, uh, Mission to Moon 3D, ah. and I love how oh. you um, actually are, I guess, your partners with the company, London Stereoscopic Company. Uh, you sort of revived that company and you're celebrating your 10th anniversary. Can I ask, what got you into the 3D part of photography? Another passion of yours. <laughs> it's childhood stuff. Yeah, things just hit you when you're a kid, I suppose. I opened a box of cereal, <laughs> Weetabix, when I was a kid, and out <laughs> dropped this little card. And on the card were two images side by side, two little pictures of a hippopotamus. Mm -hmm. And I thought, what's all this then? And it says, send away one and sixpence in a packet top to get your stereo viewer, your 3D viewer, which I did. Yes. And then I put the card into the viewer and looked through the lenses. And suddenly, instead of two little flat pictures, I had a window through which I was looking. And I felt like I could touch that hippopotamus. And it was just, again, a life-changing experience. I thought, okay, you can do this with photography. Why isn't everybody doing this the whole time? You know, if you can photograph in 3D, why would you ever bother to photograph in 2D anymore? Yes. <laughs> so, you know, that feeling has never left me, that the feeling of magic when you can combine two images, one for each eye, and you get a stereoscopic, in-depth view of whatever it is that you're looking at. To me, it's, it's, it's magic. 
<laughs> and that's what I think is incredible because you talk about these flashes of inspiration and you also seem to <laughs> react pretty quickly uh, from your song New Horizons, but also the Mission 3D, uh, Mission Moon 3D book. I understand that was a pretty rapid process from conception to finish on that. How long did that take? Yeah, we go on these mad journeys. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know quite how we survive, really. Yeah, most of those images I processed while I was on tour with you know doing Queen and Adam Lambert right. so between like 3 and 5 a.m. I would be working on those images and most of those have never been seen in 3D so that was an exciting journey in itself I mean no one's ever managed to put a, a book together of such a comprehensive um, group of 3D images from those Apollo days See, what I love about that, too, is it's not only Apollo. I mean, you start way back with Yuri Gagarin and go all the way through, and it even has your uh, 3D image of Pluto, which I, I just love. I think it's yes, fantastic. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, it's a kind of potted history of, of space exploration, I guess. Yeah, I'm, I'm very proud of it. I, I really enjoy it. I love the fact that I can hold it in my hand now, and it actually did materialize. Uh, and I, and we, we've had some great reactions to it. You know, people have said it actually feels like being on the moon. Um, which is great. To me. <laughs> Absolutely, I understand. You actually developed the uh, the stereoscopic viewer that's that's in the back of the book. You designed that yourself. I did. Yeah, I didn't invent the stereoscope. Right. Uh, Charles Wheatstone did that in 1832, mm -hmm. but I uh, designed this particular version of it, and it is really a, a 21st century version of a Victorian stereoscope. And uh, you know, you can do very, you can do 3D in many different ways. But the Victorian way is actually still the most perfect. If you get it right, you get this incredible impression of reality and depth. It's, of course, it's the, the forebear of virtual reality. And yes. the, viewer that I, the viewer that I make now, you know, we, we make it um, in Sunbury upon Thames, Middlesex, and in China. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> <laughs> of course. It's, um, it works very well as a virtual reality. And so we have a, a version of it which we put out, which we call... Um, which we sell, which is called the uh, the VR the Owl VR kit. And it's been very successful. And, and what surprised me, I guess, when I reading that is how long 3D viewing has actually been around. You know, like you said, the 1800s, and it sort of went away. And I think with your uh, efforts of these, uh, the Queen 3D book, and then your Mission Moon 3D book, I think it's neat to kind of get back in mainstream people realizing how wonderful that is. Yeah, it's been a, a mission of mine. I feel like I'm an evangelist for 3D because I love to share that magic with people. I always dreamed of it when I was growing up. And, of course, it's very hard to get hold of Victorian viewers. There aren't very many of them right. around. and they, They're expensive and they're delicate. So it was my dream to make a, a new version, uh, a, a new system which would transmit that magic to to people in, in the modern day. So now, yes, I have my Owl Viewer. I have lots of sets of cars and we publish books which are illustrated with these stereoscopic views. So it's a big thrill for me. It, it, it's a realization of, of a, an ambition I had all my life. Brian, again, I, I want to thank you so much for your time today, just for taking time out. It's been an honor speaking with you. Thank you, Chuck. I really appreciate it. Your Space Journey. Wow, I really enjoyed my conversation with Brian May and meeting him in person was a special gift. Um, I want to encourage you, if you haven't uh, looked at his book, Mission Moon 3D, it is spectacular. Check that out. If you haven't seen the movie Bohemian Rhapsody yet, it's incredible too. Check that out too. Of course, Brian's available on social media. Just follow him. His website is brianmay.com. I want to thank Brian for joining me. Also want to thank Molly Kearns for sharing her space journey earlier in the episode. Again, if you'd like to share your space journey with us, just call us at 317-862-4700. Leave us a voicemail telling us your name, what inspires you about space, and what you're most looking forward to. You can also email us an audio video clip, like I said. Just email it to info at yourspacejourney.com. We'd also really use your help. If you like this episode, please give us a like. If you're listening on Apple Podcasts, whatever podcast application, if you can give us a good rating, we'd love that too. Again, share this episode with your friends. Uh, help us get the word out. We really appreciate it. But we want to thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule to join us today. Thank you so much. We'll see you next time. God bless.